The first thing I'm going to say is, just before I even get into a solutions house, I'm an adult diagnosed autistic. God, I'm such a confident public speaker and I'm suddenly feeling like, you know, skills regression? It's like I've got full on skills regression on this panel. Um, I have enormous privileges. I am a middle-aged white woman with a posh British accent. I run my own organization. Um, uh, the f when I came out and shared my diagnosis, it just added a bit of spice to the story of Solly. There's almost no jeopardy for me. Loads of people contacted me and said, oh, you're so brave for sharing it. And I was like, oh shit, is there jeopardy attached? I hadn't realized. <laughs> like the number of times during my life people have said things like, oh, you're so brave for saying that. And it's like going, no, no, this was not an act of bravery. This was again an act of not understanding social sign significance and saying something which most people don't say. And I'm so pleased that you're interpreting it as brave as opposed to socially inept. Um, uh, Solutions House, for the last two years, has been run in the Futera offices, where I felt really at home. The Futera offices are one of my safe spaces. It's where my colleagues are. I know how everything works. I know where the loos are. Um, but we outgrew Sol Solutions House in our offices, and so we've come to this amazing space, which I'm hoping, after about three and a half days, will start to feel slightly less intimidating than it does right now. Um, Solutions House is a partnership between Futera, of which I am the chief solutionist and co-founder. I'm just looking at my name on there, and I'm so dissociated right now. And they're going, Solitaire's a really weird name. Is that really what I'm called? Um, our other partners are Google, and the Exponential Roadmap Initiative, and uh, the Sustainable Entertainment Alliance. And we've got fantastic sessions, and we've got fantastic sponsors. And Tagada, would you like, Tagada, Tagada, how do I say it in French? Tagada. If Tagada wants to come up here. We also have Tagada, our Solutions House dog. Um, so if you hit, feel someone kissing the back of your ankles, you've either made a friend with the people sitting behind you, or it's Tagada, the Solutions House dog. Now, I'm actually quite scared of dogs. Dogs, are, I'm, I actually get a bit anxious around dogs, but Tagada is a very, very good girl, and so I feel quite calm around her. But if you're the kind of person who doesn't feel calm around dogs, then Alice is Tagada's mum. Um, and Alice has lots of experience of when sometimes my not liking dogs and being scared of them comes up and she'll just come and take Tagada and take her away from me. So Tagada is lovely. A lot of people love dogs. If you're not the kind of person who loves dogs, please just put your hand up and Alice will come and take her away and Tagada will not even remember because she's had so much love these last few days. Literally, she is the star of the show. Um, I'm still, just to let everybody know, I'm still waiting for Rhonda to join us online. If someone would, could give me a heads up on whether Rhonda is able to dial in or not. So, there she is. Hi, Rhonda. Can you see and hear us? Um, Rhonda, I'm just going to do a little bit more of an introduction, and then I'll come over to you if that's okay. That's perfect. Brilliant. Thank you, Rhonda. So, um, why, did, why did we decide to gather to talk about neurodivergence. Um, over the last few years uh, of being a neurodivergent, um, I noticed how many of us there are in the sustainability and justice and change communities. Like, a lot more than there is supposedly to be in the general public. People who have a clinical diagnosis, people who have a self-diagnosis, people who have a, that sounds really familiar and I'm not going to think about it too much, diagnosis. Um, there seems to be a lot of people who identify with the neurodivergence which we already have catalogued and named. And a lot of people who identify with a, perhaps a neurodivergence that isn't even catalogued or named yet. Um, and I think that that's one of the things which we're going to find out over the next couple of years. And it's, I started to reflect on why. Why are there so many people who have... It's not an easy sector to work in. It's stressful and it's challenging and it's political and sometimes people disagree with you and sometimes people are nasty to you. All things that, as a new diversion, I all don't particularly love. It's incredibly frustrating because I'm very good at my job, but I shouldn't have to be because climate change is just fucking stupid. And the autistic part of me, which is just like, it's just stupid, 
but it turns out like going up on major platforms and saying it's just stupid and it itches my brain and can you stop please isn't the most effective way to communicate climate change so thankfully I made communicating climate change one of my special interests and I've spent 30 years investigating how to do it and how to put it across which I'm very lucky I'm also very lucky because most of my special interests um, are monetizable most of my special interests are things which I can make a career out of. Just to be clear, not all of them are. <laughs> and there are a few other special interests, such as the three handmade Star Trek cosplay costumes hanging up in my closet, which are nothing except a, fina um, a, um, a financial uh, drain. But not everybody has that. I'm also, I refer to myself as autistic. I know others prefer person with autism, person with neurodivergence. I know that there's people in this room who have got ADHD. I know there's people in this room who've got dyslexia. I know there's people in this room who have got dyspraxia or Tourette's um, or multiple other typologies. Um, and we'll have a conversation about that as well. Um, there's one other important thing that I, that I wanted to say, oh yeah. I'm sitting up here facing you, and you're sitting there facing me, and I sure as hell do not speak for you. It's one big thing. In my family, my younger sister has ADHD, and if there's one thing that we've learnt as a family is that our experiences are very different. If you're standing, please come in. It's not the kind of session where one needs to stand. Um, come in, take a seat. And also, if you decide that it's really boring and stressful, you can also leave. It's totally OK. I'll only cry a little bit. Um, uh, so what we're going to have a chat conversation about today is what are the superpowers that I believe are associated with neurodivergence of different types and I think that people have and just like autism and neurodivergence turns up in very different ways for people so do superpowers we're going to talk about uh, kryptonite <laughs> Uh, the opposite of superpowers and the things which are really, really high, hard. I am um, what's called a type 1 autistic, what used to be called um, high functioning, but I've always preferred to call high masking. When I had my clinical diagnosis, my, uh, my uh, clinician said that I was exquisitely masked, which apparently isn't a compliment. Um, <laughs> I was just like, thank you. I've tried really hard. Um, when I was a teenager and had no friends and was really, really, really struggling and was hideously anorexic, um, uh, because I didn't like the taste, everyone kept saying, you're not thin. You, you know, so you're not fat. Your body is great. It's like, yes, I know. I hate being thin, but I can't function the taste and the, the, the um, uh, texture of foods in my mouth. But when I was a teen and was really struggling, I spent uh, about six months taking notes on the rest of the teens in my school. The, 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 the different relationships, the hierarchies, the clothing, the mannerisms, and I trialed them in, in the mirror until I was able to do that. And then I ended up, I was not the most popular girl in school, but I was best friends with her. So I, I learnt to mask, for, and then I read psychology and anthropology, and I learnt how to kind of pretend to be a human being, <laughs> which is what being neurodivergent feels like most of the time. Um, so I am reasonably comfortable up here. Um, I do not speak for all autistics. I'd really love us to have a conversation. For those of you who are online, I can see the comments and questions that you put in. And yes, I will try to get tagged tag it up on the stage so you can see her. If worse comes to worse, I'm going to ask Alice to bring her up on here because apparently there is a little bit of unhappiness about the fact that not everybody can see Tagada. Um, but first of all, what I'd like to do is I'd like to introduce the most wonderful Wanda, Wanda Moore, who is online with us. Now, unlike me, who is um, purely an experiential, a life experience um, autistic speaking about my connection with climate, Wanda actually does research on this and actually has insights and thoughts about why there is this connection between neurodivergence and social change. So Wanda, would you like to share some thoughts with us? And First of all, would you mind just introducing yourself so we can check the sound in this room? Um, certainly. I'm Rhonda Moore. I'm an autistic medical anthropologist and program director um, at the National Institutes on Mental Health, uh, National Institutes of Health. I currently work in the office of the director um, and um, very interested in um, 
giving some this presentation. I'm not certain how to present um, in this mode. This is my first time presenting in Google um, Meet, so um, I might need some help with that. Um, whilst, Rhonda, whilst Rhonda and I should get that sorted out, um, I'm going to share some of the superpowers that have been raised at some of the sessions that we've done online. So if you're not part of the LinkedIn group of NeuroSpicy Solutionists, and also can someone else get their fiddle toy out because I'm feeling really lonely being on my own. <laughs> if, uh, if you're not part of the LinkedIn group on NeuroSpicy Solutionists, I'd really ask you to join um, because we've done a couple of sessions on that. What I'm going to... Some of the... Some of the um, superpowers that have been raised have been, number one, pattern recognition. So pattern recognition doesn't mean that we're particularly good at filling in crosswords, um, or you might be, but a lot of neurodivergent people of all types um, tend to be very good at seeing connections between things which perhaps others don't always see, or seeing things which actually might be the same even though they don't look exactly the same. Now pattern recognition is absolutely crucial when it comes to solutions to climate change and to, and to climate change itself because it means that we can see some of the emerging patterns in the problem but perhaps we can see some of the emerging patterns in the solution and that's one of the things which I've relied on a lot for some of my work on strategy is to sort of go yeah but if we put that together with that but with that doesn't this come out? So that was one of the big um, uh, pieces. Another piece, which is one which neurotypicals sometimes get wrong about neurodivergent people, is empathy. Um, is that actually sometimes, as an autistic, my empathy is so high it's overwhelming, and I shut down. And that's when I cut. That's when robot Solly comes out. Robot Solly comes out when overly empathetic Solly can no longer function. And actually, our empathy and our empathy for those who are other to us. They might be somebody who's other to us in terms of their geography, in terms of their life experience, in terms of their race, their gender, their age, their humanness. Like, we can feel empathy similarly to animals sometimes than we might feel to humans and elsewhere, or even occasionally to inanimate ob objects, which is one of the things which I struggle with, with my autism, is feeling empathy towards it, as, as saying sorry to chairs that I bump into. And the third big one, which I just thought was so fascinating, was if you've got the type of neurodivergence, which means you don't automatically understand what's happening in society, where you don't seem to have had that programming, where you just get why things are the way that they are, that you have to learn it and are constantly bedazzled and befuddled about why society is the way that it is, means that you have the ability to see that it's all completely fucking made up. <laughs> all of it. Our economic systems, our social systems, the market, politics, hierarchy. We invented all of it. And most people, given 10 seconds of reflection, will agree. Neurotypicals, as well as neurodiverse, will go, yes, of course I can see that that's all made up, I understand. But if you're neurodiverse, you live in the fact that it's made up all the time because you're having to try to work out what are the made up rules and systems in this situation that a bunch of human beings have decided is God given and this is the way that we need to live and therefore I need to work out how to live within it in order to function as a human being. That ability to know that it is all made up, every single part of our system, every si single part of how we live our life, how we define ourselves, how we make choices, you know, what gender is, what politics is, what money is understanding that vast majority of that was invented by human beings, sometimes for reasons which no longer are true. Sometimes they were invented for good reasons. That's why I'm interested in history and anthropology, is it means that I realize why societies are the way that they are. And they go, yes, but we no longer live in like 18th century Vienna or in like, you know, the Industrial Revolution or in ancient Greece. And there are, maybe we don't need these rules anymore. And living that way, walking through life, knowing that none of this, none of the systems that we live in are necessary or unmutable, unmovable, is a massive gift that we can bring to the world. Constantly reminding everybody else that those social rules that you feel, that 
that the social rewards that neurotypicals feel are, are, are just the way things are. As a neurodiverse, you can say, no, th those rules are completely mutable and we can change them. And I think that that is one of the reasons why over the last 30 years, everybody has always asked me, why are you so hopeful about climate? Why are you so hopeful and optimistic all the time? Okay, I'm hopeful and optimistic because I know it's all completely made up. It's like the front of a, of a, of a movie set. Like, give it a little bit of shake and it can all come falling down. And that makes me enormously optimistic because when people say, oh, things will never change, I'm like, do you reckon? <laughs> because I think things are probably much, much more changeable than you believe because all we have to do is tell ourselves a different story, create a different set of social rules, create a different system, and suddenly everybody will think that system is immutable as well. And in fact, the psychologists and the sociologists would agree with us. It's called punctuated equilibrium. Societies love their rules. And they hold on to their rules because they stratify and they give comfort and they mean that things don't change. All the things which actually as an artistic I quite like that they hold on to. But they, we tend as societies to hold on to these social rules far beyond where they served us. Well, in fact, when they're actively hurting and destructive of societies, it's sort of the capex spend, the, 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 the sunk cost of those social rules are so great, humanity doesn't like to change them. But when enough people wake up to the fact that it's all made up, you can change it, and it goes through the punch, the punctuated bit of the equilibrium, and then it will go back to another equilibrium again. So, you know, the autistics are all happy in the equilibrium, the ADHD people are very good at the punch, and then the, <laughs> then the autistics can build it up the next, um, uh, the next equilibrium again. So I believe that we're just beginning to go through one of those punches in the equilibrium. We're just beginning to go through a period of time when enough people realize that it's all made up. And I don't think it's a surprise that um, neurodivergent people are more visible and vocal than we've ever been. Because uh, honestly, I think we're called. I think we are called. We are called to this moment to, if to do nothing else is just to point out that it's made up. And those of us who are able to do a lot more may be able to do a lot more. So, thank you for that. That was my little blur, which was going to come after Wanda, but now Wanda slides her up and she looks like she is ready to roll. Wanda, are you ready to roll? I'm ready to roll. Woo! Over to thank you. Thank you so much. Um, the title of this presentation is Neurodivergence, Mental Health, and Climate Change. Um, I just completed a book on climate change and mental health equity um, for Springer um, that was looking at people, place, and community, and I realized that the we don't know as much about neurodivergence, mental health, and climate change as we need to. Um, so I want to, I'll start now. Next slide, please. The opinions expressed in this presentation are the author's own and do not reflect the views of the National Institutes of Health, the Department of Health and Human Services, or the US government. Standard disclaimer, thank you. Next slide. So what do we hope to accomplish today? We did want to describe what we know, discuss the gaps in the field, look at some next steps forward, and then looking at areas that are ripe for exploration. Next slide. The World Health, what we know. The World Health Organization and a growing number of public health and mental health professionals believe climate change may be the leading, if not existential, public health of the threat, public threat of the 21st century. Climate change is often characterized as a threat multiplier, given its potential to exacerbate many of the existing global challenges and threats, such as infectious disease, intersectional violence, and conflict over food, poverty, safe housing, and water, and other increasingly scarce resources. As a threat multiplier, climate change also interacts with the social and structural determinants of health, exacerbating existing health equities across global settings for individuals and communities. Next slide. Historically, there's been less of a focus on research and mental health impacts of climate change and mental health. Um, climate change poses significant impacts to physical health and therefore can pose additional difficulties for people with both physical and mental health conditions. And extreme weather events, which are increasing in severity and frequency due to climate change, including heat waves, wildfires, drought, and extreme precipitation, also affect people's mental health and well-being. Next slide. Oh, that was going so well. <laughs> uh, yeah, it, it was. Ah, there we go. Wonder, I think I'm going to look at my notes for this one. Um, 
this is a slide that um, um, it's um, been increasingly, climate change can have different differential mental impacts. Um, the impacts of climate change can be direct, indirect, short, long-term, and also intersectional. In this regard, I am inspired by the important work by Fiona Charlson, Helen Berry, Susan Clayton, Tori Shaw, Britt Ray, and more recently, Andreas Hines and Lassie Brandt, who are responsible for this slide. Climate change has direct, indirect, short, and long-term, as well as intersectional impacts on, client, on mental health. The direct and direct and intersectional impacts of climate change are interconnected and can cause aggregate impacts that are associated with uh, increased mental health disorders. Post-traumatic stress disorders, such as post-traumatic stress disorder, depression, and anxiety. Direct impacts of climate change, such as extreme weather events and increased disasters, are likely to have immediate impacts on the prevalence and severity of illness, including increased infectious diseases, co-occurring in multimorbidity in affected communities with significant implications to healthcare systems, security, and infrastructures. Individuals exposed to natural uh, disasters such as hurricanes, floods, and droughts are also at increased risk for mental disorders such as PTSD, um, depressive disorders, and anxiety disorders. The severity and duration of mental um, disorders following natural, natural disasters may be increased by psychosocial stressors such as personal and financial loss, becoming unhoused and forced migration, by vulnerabilities such as pre-existing mental health disorders and low social support, um, and by insufficient mental health care. Trauma, such as uh, terms such as climate anxiety, eco-anxiety, and eco-grief are often used to describe the indirect effects of climate change on people's anxiety, as well as comprehension about the possible impact of climate change. As climate continues to change and extreme weather events associated with climate change become more frequent, severe, and long-lasting, the precipitation um, of the impact of climate change on the environment is becoming a lived experience for more and more people. Several new terms for climate change-induced distress have been introduced in the literature to describe the long-term emotional consequence of anticipated or actual environmental changes. These may be referred to as psychoteriac, seriatric, or earth-related mental health risk syndromes. Chronically, the exist existential threat about the uncertain future is driving increased eco-anxiety, eco-paralysis, eco-guilt, eco-psychology, ecological grief, biospheric concern, et cetera, as well as sol solastolgia, the place-based emotional distress caused by environmental change. Mourning the loss of ecosystems, landscapes, and species, and the ways of life is, is likely to become more frequent experience around the world. However, there is a lack of conceptual clarity and systemic research efforts regarding the differential impacts and forms that so, such ecological grief may take, and development of new ph phenomenology of effects of climate change requires delineating between these very terms. Next slide, please. Recent work highlights that relatively little is known about the impact of climate change um, on the mental health and neurodiverse populations. Other work suggests that heightened risk and barriers during and after natural disasters. For instance, research shows that people with intellectual and developmental disabilities are more likely to experience poor outcomes, including increased post-traumatic stress disorder, anxiety, and stress following natural disasters such as hurricanes, cyclones, and earthquakes. The reasons behind the exclusion um, can be overlapping and include the built environment where accessibility is not built into the ex design of systems, strategy and policy structures, information and communication design, or social and economic inequalities. Next slide, please. As this research evolves, it is becoming clearer that the burden of climate change continues to be borne disproportionately by populations with pre-existing conditions, it's either serious mental illness or other vulnerabilities, geographic, socioeconomic, and that can include pre-existing mental health vulnerabilities. There are significant research gaps. Consequently, we know less about the differential impacts of climate change on neurodivergence and mental health. Next slide, please. Climate change and associated extreme weather are leading to poor mental health and well-being across the globe. However, despite a growing body of work, there continue to be important gaps in our understanding of mental health effects of climate-related exposures. Recent work highlights that relatively little is known about the global impact of climate change on mental health in neurodiverse populations. The World Economic Forum has advocated for integrating neurodiverse populations in addressing climate and environmental challenges. 
and there is a need for a research exploring effects of climate change in neurodiverse populations, including the lived experience of neurodiverse and neurodivergent individuals, to better help understand and mitigate the direct, indir indirect, and intersectional consequences of climate change in this important and understudied population. Next slide. There are significant gaps in this field. And I decided to do my small part by creating an edited volume that builds on prior work in climate change and mental health equity by elevating the science of lived experience with perspectives of intersectional neurodivergence, nature, and climate change. The stories within this book will talk about the journeys that people take, their experiences of nature, stories about why climate change matters in the context of understanding intersectional neurodivergence, aligned with stories of neurodivergent discovery, strength, self-awareness, resilience, and belonging. Next slide. So areas that are ripe for um, exploration, um, this is just across the field that I've noticed, um, but also that will be explored in the book are climate change and mental health and neurodiverse populations, disaster preparedness, divert disaster responses and climate change and neurodiverse populations. We know more from that literature, um, but not much else outside of that, including from the gray literature. Um, Self-awareness, discovery and transformation across the lifespan, the senses, nature and climate change. Communicating lived experience of climate change and mental health, belonging through community, neurodivergent leadership, nature and climate change, legal and policy implications of this important work, strength-based approaches to neurodivergence, nature and climate change, and neurodivergence, mental health and climate change from perspectives of healing and transformation. Um, those are the areas that will be explored in the book. And then I created a whole list of select references if people were oh, interested. References. Um, <laughs> And, and so, and then um, that goes on for like three slides. So next slide, next slide, next slide. And then um, that's my email if you're interested in getting in touch. Um, and thank you, I'm willing to take questions now. Thank you. Wanda, thank you so very much. Can we give Wanda a round of applause? I hope you can hear that. Oh, thank you. Um, Wanda, I'm not sure if you're able to see the room or just me, but there's a lot of people who are going yay, and I'm looking at you right here when I'm looking forward. Um, Wanda, I'm going to ask a quick question, um, which is you mentioned there that the World Economic Forum has met, said something around neurodivergence as a, as a solution to some of the issues. Is, is that something which you think is being picked up by other leaders? Like the World Economic Forum is itself quite a big deal. Um, it, it sort of what we were just talking about there that neurodivergent people have got some gifts and some superpowers that we can bring to this movement. Do you think that's part of the conversation or is it mainly about the very true and necessary negative impacts of climate change on neurodivergent people? Um, I think that um, it's mixed because I think there is um, a conversation that's ongoing with the World Economic Forum that is around solutions that um, neurodiverse, indiv neurodivergent individuals can um, add to um, the climate, climate action and climate, climate mitigation plans. And then there's um, a conversation that's around people with disabilities um, and climate change. Um, that has not necessarily included neurodivergent populations. It's starting to include um, neurodivergent populations in terms of disaster preparedness and response, and that's with people with disabilities, and there's some inclusion in terms of autistic populations. But there's not that much work that's out there, and that's why I was interested in writing the book. Brilliant, and I'm, I'm very much hoping to help Rhonda with her book, and I know that I owe you stuff. Um, uh, what I'm going to ask now is if those of you who are online and joining us could participate in this as well. We're going to ask some questions of the people in the room, but I know a lot of people prefer to participate online because you can write your answers. So I'd ask you to please um, share in the chat some of your answers. We've got some microphones, which are at the back. Um, Kim has two microphones, excitingly. Um, what I'm going to ask is uh, if anyone in the room would like to take about 30 to 60 seconds to share any thoughts or questions or to share what you think a superpower is of being neurodivergent. So um, there is a two options there. So you can, you can share anything you want to share or ask a question or you can share what you think a superpower is. We're going to talk about the problems as well, but I'd really like to start with why we're all working in this thing. We have a question here at the back, and we have a question over there. And also, I'm feeling really stressed. Can we have Tagada up on here? Would you, if she's okay, would you bring her up? Um, uh, the gentleman there with his hand up. Oh, so. Who goes first? 
She, she can sit if she wants. So please, momentary distraction. Hi, my name is Samuel Moni, um, co-founder of Purpose Hive. Uh, <laughs> and um, my neurodivergence is ADHD, which I was diagnosed about 10 years ago. And I think it's that thing of seeing a pattern or seeing a solution, and it's so blatant, patently obvious that it's just like, and you're talking to people and they're all glazed over and it's like, well, I don't understand why you don't understand. This is just so, and so you've almost jumped to the solution and then I, I think through my career, been struggling or trying to go back to get to where they are to then bring them for forwards again. Um, and I've had some career successes because of, of this, this very thing. I've seen a solution and it's, we've eventually, like 12 months later, won awards, gained market share, succeeded, but the first time you say you sound like the craziest person in the world, but then when you're on stage picking up an award, the crazy eventually worked itself out. But it's that gap between sounding crazy and and getting people to where your crazy is, which then becomes something that's a norm. It's actually a solution that it just, they just can't see. I 100% resonate with that. The seeing the solution in the pattern and then having to retrofit all the steps between where we are now and the solution and the pattern. I'll be really honest, sometimes I just make it up in a way that, that might no, sound like, I would never like make it acceptable up to somebody else. Um, but that can be a real, that's, it, there's a massive superpower in that. But learning how to bring people with you to that solution is something which doesn't always come easily. There was another question over here. Uh, yeah, just a reaction. Um, so I'm from, I'm from Puerto Rico. Uh, actually, this weekend it was the seventh anniversary of Hurricane Maria hitting Puerto Rico. And I was part of, a, let's say, a diaspora group between New York and Berlin, uh, dealing with the fact that there was a complete blackout ex immediately after the hurricane. So we just got to work across time zones in a very mutual aid kind of decentralized way. And I'm 37. I just got diagnosed with ADHD after a whole life of feeling like I was like, oh, I'm too weirdo and, you know, my astrological minded aunt would say you're just a Pisces, uh, but uh, just, 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 just be warned. Sometimes right. that's more socially acceptable. I'm like, right. oh yeah, I'm a Taurian INTJ. It's like, oh yeah, that's fine. Whereas exactly. autistic, is it always acceptable? Exactly. So I think this weekend coming in for Climate Week, in the context of what had happened in Puerto Rico, and thinking about my own journey, um, I was looking back, and and I would assume that this kind of cortisol fueled drive that happened in the immediacy combined with the, this ADHD to be able to filter information for a lot of people and on behalf of a lot of people. For example, my, my specific contribution was I built the largest database of um, volunteer and location drop-offs in the US. It meant talking to people throughout the night, people that I never come in contact with, right? Getting a, a message in the middle of the night and kind of activating on that. Yeah. And I think I'm grateful for the fact that this kind of chaotic-minded uh, approach to information gathering and filtering kind of really kicked in. I think that's such a great point. My, my younger sister is um, autistic, and by the way, many of you all know in a neurodivergence experience, we create connection by telling a story of ourselves to someone who's told a story of themselves. And in our family, there's many challenges she faced. She's a, a level two, and unless there's a crisis, in which case suddenly her ADHD flips into the thing which everybody needs. And one of the things which um, I was reading about was that there's actually some um, geneticists who are working on what is the reason why ADHD is so prevalent within society and has been so, why do we still, why has it not evolved out if it's something which is considered to be a disability or a problem? And it goes, because human beings face a lot of crisis, particularly extreme events and ADHD people often, not always, because everyone has different experiences, often are extremely good in extreme events because the, the cortisol use. And so um, I thought that was quite comforting that there is an actual, and again, one of the things which Rhonda's been looking at is the the challenges for people who have got neurodiversity, the challenge for people who have got mental health issues within extreme events. And I think it, your story perfectly puts forward that there's also gifts that we can bring to the societies. Although, if you're anything like my sister, welcome to the crash that happens after you've performed and then when suddenly all of the stress has gone away, you're like going, yeah, but now I can't make a cup of coffee. <laughs> like a week ago, I was saving people's lives. How does that work? Um, so a lot of empathy for you on that one. Thank you. 
We've got some, some points down at the front. And then Rhonda, I'm gonna to come to you after we take, we're gonna take all the points along the front row, um, just to make sure that we can capture them all. Uh, thank you very much uh, for all of this. It's been amazing. And when you said that whole spiel about everything's made up, that has literally been my mantra for the last two years from the whose line is it anyways. Everything's made up and the points don't matter. So just do it anyways. And so I guess my question is when you're in a space where you're mas high masking and around a lot of individuals who are neurotypical, if you will, trying to communicate those thoughts that you're first in this situation and they look at you, they glaze over, they think you're crazy. Do you, do you have any advice in that space on how to best communicate with those individuals to get your point across and not have them just glaze over and then start looking at their phone or looking at their watch or looking around the room because that is something that I struggle with quite a bit. Yeah. Yes, I would. I do have some thoughts on that. I'm wondering might as well, but we'll, we will come to that. Awesome. Hi, thank you so much for this. I feel so seen and accepted here. I'm thrilled. Um, I got diagnosed with ADHD last year, and we just found out that my partner is on the spectrum. Um, so we have a very <laughs> neurodivergent house in my house, but I also, uh, I work at a school in LA teaching climate justice and environmental justice um, at a school for a lot of kids that are neurodivergent for which traditional school di schooling didn't work for them. And I know a lot of the people here that are neurodivergent may have a little bit of educational trauma, um, as do I. <laughs> not knowing I had ADHD for my entire academic career. Um, and so I, I just wanted to share that as I teach climate justice and environmental justice, like everything is made up and my six and seven year olds get it. And they yeah. are they are like, yeah, why? What, what the heck is this colonialism stuff? Why didn't we just let indigenous people <laughs> do their thing? Um, and so I just wanna share that like neurodivergent kids are like, absolutely killing it right now and they are uh, really down with climate justice but the question that I have for both of you is um, with ADHD and also with my partner with autism we both are like yes new project let's take it on immediately and do everything for it and then immediately burn out and then are behind on all of the deadlines so if any of you guys have <laughs> any resources or um, advice on that I would I would love it Definitely. So we're going to come to how do you communicate um, your ideas and your solutions and your typicals. We're going to come to burnout. I bet the big light never gets turned on in your house. <laughs> it's like, I literally got lights directly on me right now. Next point. Hi, everyone. Um, my name's Amy, and I was diagnosed with ADHD about a decade ago and strongly suspect an autism diagnosis in the near future. Um, I think that one of the superpowers of neurodivergence is our authenticity, um, because I find that um, people that I know who are neuro neurodivergent, and I've gotten this feedback as well, it's hard for us to be dishonest. Mm. And so when we're working with people, there can be a level of automatic trust almost that comes um, when people are, are working with people with neurodivergence, because we will be honest and that's a superpower, I think, because deep healing happens only when there is deep honesty to acknowledge what is going on in the first place. Yeah, and the, the not understanding that sometimes in terms of, oh, oh, I wasn't supposed to be honest. That one happens to me quite a lot. Oh, this is one of the situations where I was supposed to lie. And I'm 50, I have learned to do that, but I, but I need the right signals to know that that's the case. So yeah, that, that radical honesty, great point. Can I come here? Hi, my name is Erica. I was also late diagnosed ADHD at 42 uh, when my son got his diagnosis. I was like, oh, wow, okay. <laughs> my entire life, I just thought it was a little different. <laughs> um, and one of my things is, so I've, I've worked at the executive level for the past few years, and while I recognize a lot of my struggles, one of the things is that I feel like the, the sustainability field is moving so much towards compliance, legal and yeah. accounting compliance. And I think a lot, one of the reasons I think there's a lot of us in this field is, you know, we are systems thinkers, but we're also able to deal with this, so many different topics and getting on top of so many different topics and seeing the connections. And now all of a sudden we're getting pulled into something that is very anti-ADHD. I don't know how the autistic uh, like Excel sheets and checking little tiny boxes, thousands of rows of them, but I can't do it. Like it's driving me crazy. So 
I'm also wondering how do we keep our enthusiasm, our engagement, our drives, our ability to see that we can't report ourselves out of this. There, there needs to be bigger solutions while the business world is moving towards this compliance landscape. I feel your pain. We can definitely have. Well, we don't have very much time, so we're gonna we're gonna just see if we could take one or two. Do, do you know what? If if we could just take one or two more, and then Wanda and I will will sum up, if that's okay. Thank you. My name's Erin. One of the initiatives I lead is called the Lost and Damage Collaboration. So I really loved your presentation, Rhonda. I would love to talk to you about non-economic loss and damage. I was di diagnosed with ASD quite a long time ago, so I'm quite far removed from that, and I don't necessarily identify that with it in the day-to-day. But so much of what you've said today, Solitaire, resonates so much. I, I have a very low tolerance for business as usual. Hmm. So I, I've always worked for my, as a freelancer. I have three of my own initiatives, so I relate to like starting too many things. Um, but one thing that I really struggle with sometimes is neurotypicals will set, tell me all the ways, reasons why something can't work. So I'll be like, you know, that I sometimes have these crises of like, oh, am I not seeing, all, I'm not seeing all the challenges and barriers that they see. Is there something wrong with me? The other thing that is a real superpower for me is because I lead networks is my heart. So sometimes people with autism get kind of stereotyped as being kind of robots, like you said earlier. But I feel like, at least for me, I mean, it is a spectrum and so is humanity at the end of the day. But I feel like my heart is absolutely my superpower. So thank Love you for that. this opportunity, Solitaire. Really grateful to be able to talk about this. Oh, we really appreciate that. OK, now I'm overwhelmed. Okay. <laughs> no, thank you. Do you hear me? No. Yeah. Uh, okay. Hi, I'm AJ. Um, thank you for providing this space. Um, so I'm actually getting my PhD, finishing my PhD. Oh. Um, and I got diagnosed with ADHD after getting kicked out of the PhD. And then I fought my way back in. Um, Woo! <laughs> thank you. Um, and now I'm interested, I'm like about to teach a class on the concept of future and its political implications because even the idea of future is kind of made up, like we created that. Um, so one superpower I think we have, or I have as an ADHD person is finding similarities in things that are seemingly uh, dissimilar and I think this makes us a makes us great communicators in the sense that we can always find examples that are relevant to the specific audience we have and it's like oh here's an analogy that you might relate to um, so I think it's important to recognize that in like climate communications um, and yeah but I guess the challenge is, is like my life is marked with like highs and big lows. It's like, yes, I get kicked out and then I get a PhD as well. So I oscillate between two extremes and I don't know like how to follow a straight line uh, that is like life. I, I, I don't think many of us have straight lines, <laughs> yeah. honestly. Yeah, I think, but like yeah. see, I feel like that's the expectation, and I I never seem to. It's when people ask you about your you. your how did you get here, and you go, how long have you got? <laughs> it's like, it's like can, can, can I make something up that would just sound like a straight line? Um, but that's a great point, folks. We don't have very much time left, so I'm going to ask Wanda to take about about two or three minutes, Wanda, to respond to any of that. Please choose which bits you want to respond to, and then I'll close us out and see if how much I can answer. Um, I just wanted to, you know, respond to um, about ADHD and autism and burnout um, because I had a recent experience of that myself. Um, I spent, um, I was working at NIMH, the National Institutes on Mental Health, um, being told that climate change and mental health was not going to be a big area of interest. It wasn't going to grow as a field and that there wasn't going to be that much interest in it in terms of my portfolio. Um, and I just remember saying, well, that what you think, that's not what I'm going to do. So that's when I did an edited volume on the topic. But I burned out during right before that period, and I had just been diagnosed as autistic at age 50, and then at age 52, got diagnosed with ADHD. 
and um, was trying to make sense of myself in my new normal um, because when you're burned out and you're trying to make sense of your life, um, it's almost like you're living it backwards, looking at all the things, ways in which autism and ADHD were part of your life, but at the same time when I was burning, burned out. Um, I just gave myself grace. Um, it took a while for me to recover. I, it included a hospitalization, um, and it was that bad. And um, when I came out of it on the, on the blue side of it, um, I realized that I didn't have to listen to these people and I, I could continue to move on with my, forward, with my life. But the burnout period was just a little disillusioning. Um, I was a little depressed and had a lot of anxiety, um, but I learned tips and skills um, that I'm happy to share um, in longer than two minutes. Um, but if you reach out to me, I'm happy to share what works for me um, and what how it, um, breathing exercises help me um, in terms of the work that I'm doing. I'm taking a big deep breath whilst you say that, Wanda. Thank you so much, and that's an incredibly generous offer, Wanda, to have to have said that. I'm going to quickly see whether. Okay. Right, let me use autism superpower. Oof. Okay, number one, how do you communicate your insights and your thinking in a way that connects the line up for people who are neurotypical? I don't know, because uh, I try to do that quite a lot. The biggest hack I found is to find a dear friend or colleague who is neurotypical, who has got the patience to work out what you're trying to say, and then will help you walk the steps back and tell you which bits are useful to communicate and which bits aren't. It's the biggest thing at, as someone who's neurodivergent is needing neurotypical allies who value your neurodivergence but also recognize the fact that there's some shit you suck at and there's some shit I suck at and so having ha having people who will have the patience to sit and go you've proven enough times that you come up with good stuff and so I'm going to sit with you to work it out and then I'm going to work out how, what steps need to be communicated and then usually what they come up with is steps that need to be communicated I'm like really those are the bits that people need to know not like this interesting science thing or this like analogy from the classical world no okay and and and, and I, I also have to trust them that that information is right burnout is such a big one I just want to talk talk about burnout for a second um, the way in which I manage burnout is I burn out all the time I do mini burnouts I, d I do what's called indoor days, where I, because my autism is that I'm actually nonverbal. When I'm, when, if I'm, I'm, if I'm speaking, I'm masking, um, and that took me a really long time to realise, even with family which is quite challenging and there's a lot of loneliness associated. And so what I do is I burn out in many ways a lot and I completely, like, I don't like, I'll be really honest, this is way too much overshing. I don't like showering. I don't like the feeling of water on my skin. I don't like brushing my teeth. I don't like touching my hair. There's certain foods that I like to eat, almost all of which are crap like bad for my health and I will spend a Sunday not speaking not washing watching my shows that I've watched 40,000 times before and eating crap and if I do that enough if I let myself go enough I can keep going whereas if I try to hold myself in my neurotypical presenting self for too long I burn out so mini burnouts are the way in which and, and deliberate and scheduled and unavoidable and I will not leave the house and I will not speak to another person whilst those are going on that's my main one the compliance versus entrepreneurship oh my god like um, yes there are some autistics who and that mindset, the, the, the logic mindset, who are really performing at the moment, and we need that. But humanity has always needed both. We've always needed the managerial and the opportunity and the entrepreneurial. We've always needed the compliance and the creativity. And at the moment, sustainability is in a massive compliance mode. And it's really boring. And I say that as an autistic, I'm not even ADHD. Um, and I'm doing my best to try to pull us back into a creative space. And there's a lot of other people who are doing the same because otherwise we will be stuck in compliance only and nothing nothing will move on. I want to just talk a little bit about some of the loss and damage stuff that you mentioned and the the, the being understood and the sense of belonging because actually even being in a situation like this and going, wow, there's more than three people here. 
Maybe I'm only a little bit weird. Maybe I'm like 70 people weird rather than two people weird, which is what I sometimes think. We've got a lot of people online as well. So actually that sense of belonging and community is something which I'm gonna be working on after this. We've got the newer Spicy Solutionist group online. I'm gonna see if we, we can get some funding to have some more gatherings and some more connections and get together, whether we can reach out to parts of the world where we would need access to translators, where we can make a welcoming space for those who do not and will not ever have a diagnosis because it's not safe for them, but where we can create a space anyway. And I just wanted to come to your line of going, you are awesome. Going and doing a PhD after being kicked out is brilliant. Like it really, really is. I also... It's hard. I, I couldn't read or write when I was 13. And I have two master's degrees. I have failed so many times, so spectacularly, so publicly, um, that it's like, like, I will be in therapy for the rest of my life. Um, I think one of the things about being a neurodivergent is that's going to happen because the failure is baked in. The fuck-ups are baked in. We do not fit within, this, within the boxes that society provides for us, which means we're going to fall sideways out of them. If you've managed to do more than the fuck-ups, if you've managed to have some successes as well, you are quizzing because a lot of people don't get that kind of balance, actually. Uh, one of the things, those of us who are in this room, those of us who are online, those of us who are able to participate in a conversation like this, like, hands up, we recognize our privileges, that we are able to be part of this. And there's a lot of people out who, who aren't. So I think the thing about it is to, is to, and I'm not sure if this is helpful at all, but to go, failure is baked into being neuro neurodivergent, success isn't. So if you're getting any success at all, you have our respect, our gratitude, and even a bit of our envy, because actually the failure is sort of comes with it because of the system with which we, went, we, we work, because our system is failing. This is the final thing, just to remind ourselves, those of you who are in this room have an enormous amount of challenges and issues and itchiness and brain itchies and difficulties and all the wonderful work that Wanda was sharing with us in terms of the mental health implications, but we do also have gifts. We have this ability to see the world in the way that, are, that others can't. And we've had a great question of someone who's, who said, thank you for saying I've got a calling. I agree, what do I do about that? <laughs> I thought it was, it was a great, great question. Thank you. Um, what I would say is, don't be shy. That probably right at the moment we're in, politically, socially, and environmentally, there is some openness from society in hearing about other ways, in hearing that it's made up, in hearing what other solutions might be, in hearing the creativity and the inventiveness and the ideas of what it might be. Society might be going through one of these punctuated equilibrium moments where people are prepared to hear it's all made up and we can make it up a different way. That window won't remain open. But for now, we are the right people in the right place to say that. So say it to your friends, say it online, write it down, be creative, tell the dog, make a song, make a, make a story, tell the world that it's all made up and we can make it differently. And then, like, how amazing if neurodivergence becomes part of the solution rather than being regarded as a problem as it so often is. Thank you for joining me. I really, really appreciate those who had the guts and bravery to come today. I know it's not easy coming along and saying something like that. Also, thank you to the many of you in the room who are allies, who are allies of neurodivergent people, who are family members of neurodivergent people. We do love neurotypicals. We need neurotypicals. Um, and also, if you're someone who up until now thought that you were neurotypical and having gone through this session, you're going, hmm, <laughs> this all sounds quite familiar. Ma ha 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 ha. <laughs> well, somebody once said, if, you're, if, if you've got a whole load of friends who are neurodivergent yes. and they think you're neurodivergent, that's not diagnosis, that's peer review. So thank you so, so, so very much. Thank you to Rhonda. <laughs>